Good morning, everybody. <laughs> well, tomorrow is your SAT, and welcome back to another live stream from Scalar Learning. Now, if you can't tell, and if you look in my eyes right now, you can see I'm, I'm quite tired because it's 5 a.m. in Los Angeles where I live. But uh, I normally wouldn't be doing a live stream this early, but I got a lot of requests and a lot of people asking because the test is tomorrow. What's up, Ayush? I got a lot of people asking me to do a live stream earlier today instead of where when I was planning to do it to make sure that they could watch and learn from what this presentation and what today is all about because the SAT is tomorrow. And I thought, you know what? That's true. Uh, I can probably do it. I just got to get up really, really early. Uh, but it, it's an it's such an important test. And I know that a lot of people ask, so I'm, I'm going to oblige. <laughs> Doing my best. I'm really, really tired, but uh, hopefully I'm going to wake up as we as we kind of move throughout all this all this material. Okay, I got my tea, drinking it. We're going to get going. Let's start with the presentation. So the first reason why I wanted you guys to tune in today is because in addition to doing more practice problems, which I'm going to do, I want to go over my five essential tips presentation and this is super important because what this is is basically a way that you can gain potentially 50 points uh, on your SAT score in the math section just by implementing what I'm about to go over. Now, it won't be necessarily 50 points for everybody. Some of you are probably already doing half of these things, all of these things, one of these things. But I'd say in total, these little, little tricks, and they can it could boost your score by more than 50 points depending on where you're at right now. But here we go. So first of all, what does it mean to jump by 50 points? What, what does that equate to? Really, on the SAT, it could be as little as four points. It could be more, or four questions. It could be five questions. It could be three. I mean, it depends where you are on the curve. But that's a good realistic average is just four more questions right. Now, if we look at this, this diagram here, you can kind of see, let's, let's take a good example here on the math. If we look at something like, uh, let's go up in the higher area. If we look at something like 32 questions right to 36 questions right, oh, that's all actually in a 30-point jump. Hold on. It depends where we go. Um, 5, 45 to 49. 44 to 49, that's a, that's a five-point jump, five questions right, okay? And that's about a 40-point jump. And then if we look here, 53 to 57, that's only a, a difference of four questions, and that's right there jumping 50 points. So when we get up in that higher level, that small difference of questions, four questions, can take you from a 740 to a 790, which is pretty crazy because four questions, it's just to it's jump that substantially from four questions it's a lot. And so we can clean these things up and really make a difference in a short period of time. Now, again, you can see it doesn't have the same impact over here. 16 to 20 is only a 40-point jump, but it's a lot still. Here are the tips. Tip number one, solidify your mental math abilities. So much of this test, as you see, when I take it, is all about mental math and calculating quickly, effectively, efficiently. And... You're saying, well, it's the day before the test. What really can I do? Just warm up. Tomorrow, tonight, even in the morning, that's the one thing you can do is you can do some multiplication practice. Really, that's the most important thing. And there's some easy ways to practice. There's some really cool games. These are both apps. Sushi Monster, I believe, is free. Quick Math is a dollar. But you can 
just work on some practice before you go in just to get everything nice and clean and and fluid so that the day you go in you're you're not making mistakes or you're making fewer mistakes you're going faster you're saving time etc having good mental math or warming yourself up the day before can make easily the difference between one question one question that you're getting right versus otherwise you make may make that mistake so Mental math has become such an important part of this test, especially because of the no calculator section. Tip number two, draw or write everything out. Look, we're talking about geometric diagrams, figures, triangles, things that they are discussing, but they haven't given you a diagram, or maybe they have given you one. The bottom line is, if there's no diagram, make it, make one. And if there is one, fill it in with whatever additional information you're getting. Okay, so if, you, if they're giving you specific numbers and variables linked up, you need to fill that stuff in so everything is super clear. If they're giving you an equation or they're giving you numbers to plug in, write it out. Write everything out. Yes, doing things in your head to a certain degree is totally fine, but when it comes to formulas, uh, uh, diagrams, etc., no mental work. Write it out. Okay. And then the last thing is, Cross off eliminated answers. I mean, unless the, the right one is just popping out to you, but definitely use that method of elimination. And you'll see me do that today when we do the calculator section. Tip number three. Ooh, this is a huge one, okay? If factored, foil, if foiled, factor. Meaning, anytime you see something in that is a quadratic, don't even think about it. In this case, right, if we saw something like this, so this is beyond, it goes beyond a quadratic when you foil it. It's in factored form. And you might be wondering, how do I know is it which one it's equivalent to? Just factor, I mean, just foil, just multiply it out. And if you do that, a lot of times you, you may otherwise be stuck. But once you do that, you'll be like, oh, well, wait a minute. Now I see where to go. You just keep moving forward with the trust that you'll figure it out. And with something like this, you will figure it out one, as soon as you FOIL. And in this case down here, right, that's, in, that's already been FOILed. So if you can't FOIL, factor instantly. You see something like that? Let me see what it looks like if I factor it and then factor it, and then the answer will most likely jump out to you. Tip number four, if you start getting stuck, jump to the free response section. Man, this is so huge. The reason why this is important is because, let's say for the calculator section, or no calculator section. Uh, well, let's talk about calculator section first, and it's 30, 38 questions. Now, let's say you get to questions number 20, 21, 22, 25. They're going to start getting really hard, especially 25 through, through 30. But then when you jump to the, to the free response section 31 through 38, you'll see from 31 through about 35, the difficulty is going to reset. It's going to be way easier. So if you're getting stuck on some difficult problems, just hit, just jump straight to 31, knock out 31 through 35. And those are questions that you're probably going to get right. Uh, you want to do that so you maximize your time. You want to make sure that you get all your easy ones correct before working on the hard ones. Uh, if need be. And then for the no calculator section, that's those are questions 16 through 20. So I'd say 10 through 15 can be tougher, 12 through 15 for sure. And if you're, if you're getting stuck there, just jump through, jump to 16 through 18, knock them out, and then be done. Tip number five, know the formulas you need. Not know all the formulas, know the formulas you need, okay? In order to know what you need, you got to know what's given. And this is what's given. On both sections, calculator and non-calculator, you're given all the stuff for circles, rectangles, triangles, <laughs> special right triangles, which are really tough to memorize or can be, uh, volume formulas for those shapes. So if you know that in the back of your mind, you're not going to waste your time memorizing this stuff. You're going to remember that, hey, I can jump back and check this if need be when, when going through the test. So here's what you need. Slope of a line, slope intercept form, midpoint formula, distance, length of an arc, area of a sector, quadratic formula, SOHCAHTOA, probability, 
an equation of a circle, which is a huge one, okay? Equation of a circle is, it's probably tested twice almost now on every SAT, usually once in the calculator and once in the no calculator section. And, and that's a hard one. But uh, I have a song actually to help you guys with that one. I have a song for a few of these. I have a song for slope intercept form, a quadratic formula, and the circle formula. You can check those out actually today. It's a great way to, to remember these if you need help it's as a musical mnemonic. And just check my math music videos. It's called Circles on a Coordinate Plane. But that you can, once you hear the chorus and if you memorize that chorus, which is really easy, it goes like, uh, it, it, it goes from this order, but it's it's like X minus H squared plus Y minus K squared equals R squared. So it's like that. And then once you get it in your head, no problem. You're not going to forget it. R, of course, are the radius. H and K are the center coordinates of the circle. All right, that's it for the presentation. And I really wanted you guys to watch that because I do think it can make a nice difference in your test score. Uh, let's quickly see if there's any comments. Uh, for the grid, in, can you fill in the bubble anywhere? Yeah, it doesn't matter as long as it's the right number. Yeah, like for example, if this is your grid in, oops. Right, and your answer is let's say 114. You could write 114 and bubble it in, or you could write 114. It do, both are correct. Okay, cool. So guys, let's do it. We're gonna start with. Oh, there's a ton of these. I'm so sorry. I'm just so exhausted. Sorry, guys. It's been a long week, and it's early. Now, this is the March SAT. I have not seen this SAT, and as always, that's part of the fun. Uh, that's what I do on my channel if, you, if you're new here. And I'm going to time myself. I'm going to do this under real-time circumstances and settings to give you guys the authentic feeling of what it's like to actually problem solve in real time. Because I'm gonna be taking this time, I'm not gonna be able to respond to questions while I do it, but hopefully I'll be able to answer questions at the end. Without further ado, here we go. Let's start the stopwatch. We have 55 minutes, I believe. All right, let me make sure that's correct here. I'm pretty sure it's right, but oops. I think it's 55 minutes. Yeah, 55 minutes, right? Okay. Ready, set, and Oh, calculator's up. All right, ready, set, and begin. Which of the following is equivalent? So look, remember I said if factor, foil. So we're going to foil this guy. Boom, 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 boom. So it becomes 3 times 2x is 6x squared. 3x is 9x plus 6x, right? That's this guy, plus 6. Combine like terms, 6x squared plus 15x plus 6. Wait, what? What happened? Did I do this wrong? Oh, 9x, 6x, 4x. Oh, oops. That's supposed to be 4x. 9x plus 4x is 13x. Actually, wait. Oh, boy. Making mistakes. There we go. All right. Got to wake up. The function is defined above what value is f of negative 2 plug negative 2 in. It's 2 times negative 2 minus 11 is negative 4, which is negative 15. Based on the table above, what fraction of lights were delayed for airline A? 
Airline A, we have 861 out of 2890. Okay. Right, it's the delayed out of total. Political scientist wants to predict how the res residents of New Jersey will react to a new bill. Which of the following study is, is designed to provide reliable results? We need random. Uh, this might be okay. Serving a group of 300 randomly selected New Jersey residents. Mm, this is better. This is not good because now we're pre-selecting people from a university. This is not good because th that, that's again broader than New Jersey. So we either want the mailing a questionnaire or serving a group um, it's got to be surveying. I'm just trying to figure out between the two. We have a larger sample size here, and it's probably better to survey them than mail them a questionnaire, arguably. More people will do it. Maybe you could argue, but yeah, that's, that's what I'm going with. Okay. Page two. All right, if the ratio of 0.5 is equivalent to, or 0.5 to x is equivalent to 1.5 to 2.25, what is the value of x? Let's cross multiply. Actually, no, we don't even need to. I can see that to get from 0.5 here, we multiply by 3. So we do the same thing here, which means that 3x equals 2.25, which means that x equals, divide by 3, x equals... 0.75, let's double check, cool. Based on the question above, equation above, what is the value of 2ax minus 1? Okay, if I divide this whole side by 4 and divide this by 4, 2, we get 2ax minus 1 equals 6. A website administrator is considering one of the two models above to predict the total number of purchases made after the website's advertisement campaign begins. How many more purchases are predicted by the exponential model than the linear model five weeks after the advertising campaign? The linear model is the top one, so it would be 10,000. You plug 5 in times 2 is 10,000. This is 2 to the x, so it's 500 times 2 to the fifth power which is, I'm going to use my calculator, to the fifth, I think it's 32, which is 16,000. So 6,000 more, right? How many more purchases, right? Not, that's the tricky one. Next. Okay, which of the following could be graphed for the reservoir's capacity in acres? Okay, the Coringo Reservoir's original storage capacity of that and the year in which it was built. Starting in 1929, sediment carried downstream, collected in the reservoir, began reducing the reservoir storage at a rate of 1,700 per feet. Look, the capacity is going down. So this means it's going up. This is wrong. This is going up. This is wrong. I'd say it's A. This, it sounds like linear. It doesn't sound like this. Uh, wait, hold on. 
1928. Approximate rate of 1700 per year. Yeah, I feel like it's A because, because this is like, uh, it's kind of not really changing at first. And then it's kind of going down. Then it's increasing. See how it's kind of going down faster? It doesn't say that. It just says it's 1700 per year. Uh, the only thing I don't like is that it's saying after 1928. It says starting in 1929 when that happens. So in 1928, the first year, it should stay constant. But I guess that's the top part, and then 1929, whatever. So I, I, it's not perfect, but I'd say it's A. What is the approximate storage capacity at the end of 1993? Okay. So 1929 to 1993 is 93 minus 29 equals 64 times 1700. Um, so that's how much it decreased. Minus, and then that's, we have to subtract it from 300. Oops. Now I'm just doing the subtraction reverse. It's the same thing. It's just positive. So 191,000 should be. Wait, what? I'm tempted... to go with this. Ooh, but that doesn't make sense. In acres per feet, the end of 1993. Why is that? Why is that less than what I calculated in 1929? An original storage capacity. Seventeen hundred per feet. Maybe because I was supposed to subtract from uh, here. Hold on, ninety-three minus twenty-eight times seventeen hundred equals. Yeah, I think I had the year wrong. So one hundred eighty-nine thousand five hundred. I think that's right. Okay. Next. The reservoir's capacity two years after 1928 between blank and blank. Which of the following must be true? So I think that it is set. So it's dropped by eight and 10,000. So it's 10,000 divided by 1,700. Because I basically, it, that's what the, the drop is. So it's five, it's six and. It's, it's roughly in, oops, it's roughly in here. I'd say four and six. Oh, which of the following must be true? Hold on. Yeah, it's between 4 and 6. So that's what we calculated, 4.7. Uh, the other one was 10,000 divided by 1,700, which is 5.88. So it's definitely one of, in between that zone. Okay. First three pages are done. Two, three, four. All right, the scatter plot above shows. Oops. The relationship between the amount of dictary cholesterol 
The amount of total fat in grams and 12 sandwiches. The line of best fit predicts the amount of total sandwiches. How many grams of total fat are in the sandwich for which this prediction is most accurate? Okay. Basically, what they're asking is, where is the prediction right lined up with the actual data? And it's like this point right here, because there's one point that's right on the line of best fit. And it's for 60, 60 grams. How many grams of total fat are in the sandwich for which this prediction is the most accurate? 60. That's it. You just got to understand what, what they're asking there. Otherwise, it's a hard question. Which of the following is a solution? All right, let's solve. Okay, first, I want to isolate that square root. So 14 minus x equals. Subtract 2 from both sides. x minus 2. Square both sides. This be, removes that square root. This becomes, you have to foil it, x squared minus 4x plus 4. And now I'll get everything on the same side. Subtract 14 and add x. So I get 0 equals x squared. x plus negative 4x is negative 3x. Negative 14 plus 4 is negative 10. And now we FOIL, or factor, excuse me. It's minus 5 plus 2 because negative 5 and positive 2 combine to negative 3 and they multiply to negative 10. So my solutions are 5 and negative 2. But now we have to plug these in and make sure that they're both valid solutions. One is definitely not a valid solution. So if I, if I plug in, I bet 5 is probably okay. Negative 2 is not. Negative 2 I plug in, I get 14, 14 plus 2 is 16, square root of 16, plus 2 equals, again, negative 2, and 16 is 4, plus 2 equals negative 2, and that's it's not right. So negative 2 is out. Hopefully 5 works, and it has to work, it's got to be C, but I'll prove it anyways. 14 minus 5 is 9, uh, Square root of 9 plus 2 equals, what is it, 5. That's 3 plus 2 equals 5. 5 equals 5. And there it is. That is the fourth page. Let's do the fifth page. You notice I've barely used my calculator thus far. Here, I mean, I have used it, but not much. Um, just a testament to the fact that if your mental math is sharp, and you, you don't need it, and it, you can go way faster without it. Okay. Graph shows the price that a chemical company charges. for fragrance oil. Based on the graph, which of the following statements must be true? The company charges more per pound for orders greater than 100. For orders less than 100. OK, here's my 100 line. That's false. It's actually charging less per pound. Because look, after this, we go up by 20 pounds, and it's a, it's a shallower slope. Like you can see that we go from $1,000 to 1200 maybe around here. So 40 pounds is 200 bucks there. But here, if we start at 200, 40 pounds is 400. So it's definitely not A. Copy charges are less per pound for orders greater than, yeah, it's B. Greater than 1,000 pounds. We don't know, that's not even on the graph as 1,000 pounds. No, that's obviously not true, it's B. Next, 2x plus 3, what is the value of x plus 8? So let's solve for, yeah, let's solve for x. So subtract x from both sides, we get x plus 3 equals negative 4 minus 3. x equals negative 7. Negative 7 plus 8 is 1. 
A group of 10 students played a certain game. Every player received a score equal to an integer from 1 to 10. For the 10 players, the mean score was 4. Wait, what? Oh, got it. If more than half the players received a score greater than five, and the mean is four, what must be true about the mean of the score of the remaining players? Well, if their mean is greater than five, or their, well, they, it's definitely greater than five because they got scores more than five, uh, it must be less than four has to be to balance it out because we've got more than half the players are like five, six, seven, eight, eight, whatever, nine, let's say. This side here, these four, have to really balance out that those higher values to get it to get it down to a mean of four, as it said. Where did it say that? The mean score is four. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. I don't know if I'm it can't be between four and five. That wouldn't be enough of a drop. It's got to be below four. So I, I'm just trying to make sure I didn't oversimplify that. But I think that's good. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, the figure above represents a rectangular painting with a frame that is two inches wide, as it shows there. The expression this represents the area of the frame the, in square inches. Oh, just the frame, got it. What does the quantity blank represent? Okay. This has to represent this. Why do I know that? Because this area of the frame, clearly the area of the whole thing is 2x squared because it's 2x times x, right? And if we need to calculate just the area of the frame, which isn't all in here, we're obviously taking the area of the whole thing and then subtracting this inside. So this quantity, and I can prove it, but I don't need to, it's, just, it's clearly representing the area of the picture uh, of the inner rectangle. It has to be, and that's all. We're not even going to look at it further. The function is defined above, is defined by this. What is the value of g of 3? Got it. It means we're plugging 3 in for f of x and then adding 5. So it's 3 times 3 plus 5. And then another 5 is being added on. This is 8 times 3 is 24 plus 5 is 29. This is just understanding function notation, what this means. And this g of 3 means we're plugging 3 into the function. That's it. A sample of 609th graders was selected at random. Asked how much they spend on homework each day. Of the 9th graders selected, 220 spend less than 2 hours on homework each day. If the conclusion was drawn that approximately... 1.359 million ninth graders spend less than two hours a day. Which of the following is close to the population in millions of ninth graders? So it's 220 out of 600 equals. Okay, let me explain why I'm doing that, doing it this way. So I know that my percentage is this, and we're saying that this is representative of the whole population, which we don't know. But of that, or of ninth graders, but of that whole population, 1.35 million is the same as 220. See how I'm matching it up? Let me just cross multiply and solve for x. So 600 times 1.35, 810, so 220x. And then we divide by 220. It's 3.68 million 
or something. There we go. Because it says in millions. Next, x, y, blah, blah, blah. Solutions equation of what is the value of x1 and x2. All right, how do we solve this system of equations? Set them equal to each other. So look, I'm, I'm going to isolate the bottom one for y. So it's going to be y equals x squared minus 11. Okay, the reason why I'm doing that is because now I can set this quantity equal to negative 2 because they both equal y. So negative 2 equals x squared minus 11. 0 equals x squared minus 11 plus 2. Uh-oh. So it's not factorable, which means we got to use the quadratic formula. Uh, uh, you know what? I'll complete the square instead. Let's get rid of that. So then I'm going to add... This is not... Nice. This is messy. Very messy. Wait, should I do completing the square? Yeah. No, I don't like... No, I'm not going to do completing the square. Let's use the quadratic. Okay. So let's use the quadratic, which is <clears throat> negative b, which is 11, plus or minus square root of b squared 121 minus 4ac, which is 8. 4 times 1 times 2, which is 8, over 2a, which is 2. 121 minus 8 is 11 plus or minus. Why am I having trouble? 113 over 2. Did I write this down wrong or something? Square minus 11 equals negative 2. Oh my god. <laughs> wow. I just realized what I did wrong. That is sad. These are combined. <laughs> this is 0 equals x squared minus 9. <laughs> Sorry guys. I'm just not seeing things right now. So then so these combine and then it's 0 equals x plus 3 x minus 3. We, it's a difference of squares, uh, which means my x values are 3 and negative 3. That's it. It's D. Okay. Because 3 makes this go to 0, 3 make, negative 3 makes that go to 0. And there it is. All right. I think this is page. Oh, 6. So now we're on to page. Oops. Page 7. Two, three, seven. We're getting there. Okay, the energy pyramid shows four trophic levels in an ecosystem, uh, all right, average 10% of net energy. This is another thing, honestly, is don't get bogged down in all this technical science language. 10% of the net energy of trophic levels is transferred to the next trophic levels, blah, blah, blah. Okay, based on the energy pyramid, if primary producers have 5,000, oops, how much energy in calories is transferred to the secondary consumers in this ecosystem. 10%. So that means they get 500, right? 10% is transferred. Wow, that's, I think that's true too. That's like not very much. So 500 is transferred and we know that one calorie is 4.18 joules equals X calories is 500, cross multiply 4.18 equals 500, 4.18 X divided by 4.18, 500 divided by 4.18. 
Uh, 119.6. There it is. Next, which of the following is equivalent to the expression of this? I can't read that. I think that's the, I think that's this. Okay, look, the root is always on the denominator if we make it a fractional exponent, and the exponent is the numerator, so it's just this. Unless there's something I can't read, but I think that's it. Uh, it's this guy. Next is the graph shows the speed of an automobile during the first five minutes of travel. What is the total distance traveled from one to four? So from here to here. Okay, let's think about it. So it's going miles per minute. So we're going half a mile per minute for this distance here. So here we're going 0.5, because that's a minute. Here we're going 0.5, because that's another minute. Here we're going 0.5 again. So it's 3.5, or 1.5. 0.5 plus 0.5 plus 0.5. Another data analysis question, a lot of these. What is that? Is that seven? Yeah. So now we do eight, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, in the figure above, sine of 90 minus x equals 12 over 13. What is the value of sine of x, all right? So look, what this is saying is 90 minus x is this, okay? If you're unsure about that, remember these two have to add up to 90 because that's 90 and all three add up to 180. So they're saying sine of 90 minus x is, sine of this is opposite over hypotenuse, 12 over 13. So if that's the case, this is a, uh, tri right triangle Pythagorean's theorem tells me that this has to be five. It's also a Pythagorean triple. So now they want sine of x, which is this value, opposite over hypotenuse, which is five over 13. Let's see the time, because I'm being kind of chill right now. <laughs> I'm so tired, uh, but we got plenty of time. Usually I always have a lot of good time surplus on the calculator section, so we still got 25 minutes. The equation above can be used to approximate speed in meters per second of an object t seconds after being dropped. Which of the following is the best interpretation of 9.8? It's the, I know what it is. It's the, it's just the speed period. I mean, acceleration. <laughs> um, because it's the change in the speed, right? This is speed, it's, we're, it's our slope, so. Yeah, it's this one, increase in speed. Every second that it's dropped. So first it's going 9.8 meters per, uh, and then whatever, after two seconds it's going almost like 19.6, etc. cetera. Uh, it's not this, because that would mean it's constant, it's accelerating. Uh, wait a minute. It is also the, in no, it's not the initial speed, it's no, the initial speed is zero. Okay, cool. A magazine article on video game habits in the United States reported that 2012 gamers spend an average of 5.6 per week. That reported the average for 2013 to be 6.3. Oh, shoot. How did the average change from 2012 to 2013? It went up by 0.7. And what type of an increase is that? We do 0.7 divided by 5.6. And then that tur turn that into a percentage. <laughs> 0 0.125 or 12.5%. And it's an increase. Clearly it went up, right? So that one we can eliminate and then these other ones etc. You just got to know that you divide the change value over the original, not the new. Like I bet you 11.1 .1 is probably 0.7 divided by 6.3. Let's just try it. Yeah. 
So that's how they get you. And this is page nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, in the system equations above, A is a constant. What is the y value of the solution to the system? Oh, oh cool. All right, so we're solving for y. So let's, let's do a little elimination maybe, right? Let's say 5x I think elimination is going to be my easiest play here. And we want to solve for y, so let's eliminate the x's. I'm going to multiply the bottom by 5, the top by 3. We got 15x plus 3y equals 3a. Negative 15x minus 10y, right? Just multiplying the 5 equals 25. And then we're going to add these together. It cancels out. That's 13. Oh, sorry. Negative 10 plus 3 is negative 7y equals 3a plus 25. Divide both sides by negative 7. And we get this. 3a plus 25 over negative 7. Oh, they just put the negative on top. It's this guy. Right? That negative come on, on the 7 or in the numerator. <clears throat> getting close. The graph, so you see how these are getting harder now? The graph of the equation above in the xy plane is a parabola. Which following is equivalent that includes the x and y coordinates of the vertex x constants. It's in vertex normal form. The way we get there is we complete this. Well, I'll show you. x squared minus 6x minus 16. We kind of quarantine that. And then take half of this and square it. So it's x squared minus 6x plus 9. Half of 6 is 3 squared is 9 minus 16. But since we're adding 9 here, we have to subtract 9 to balance it out. And then this becomes minus 25. And then we factor this. This is a perfect square of x minus 3 squared. And that's what it should look like. x minus 3 squared minus 25. I can't read that, but I'm sure it's a minus 25. It's, it's got to be. And then it tells me that my vertex is at 3, negative 25. Because it's always the opposite of this one, the regular of that one. Okay, that's 9. Now we go to page 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Okay, for a particular office building with 1,420 employees, Tia and Amir each conducted a survey about the average one-way commute times. Hold on. Oh, doesn't help. This is just blurry. All right, it's all right. One, the average one-way times and minutes between the employee's home and office. Both Tia and Amir selected employees at random, mailed out surveys, and collected data. Uh, for both surveys, respondents were asked to report their average commute times. To the nearest five minutes, Tia collected data from 150 employees and Amir collected from 85. The results were shown summarized below. This is a box and whisker plot. You know, I don't see this much on the SAT, but really this is the first time, actually. I can't remember another time. This, let me explain it. The endpoints are the range, so that means he got as low as 15, as high as 65. That little line is the median. This is mean, actually, to do a box and whisker plot because I've never seen this on the SAT. And some people may not know what this is or forgotten. I happen to know what it is because I'm you know, teaching math all the time. But, and then that's my median value, and this is my interquartile range from 25 to 40. But this one everybody knows, right? Uh, histogram. So, uh oh, whoa, 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 whoa. What did I just do? Okay. 
if T is the median commute who responded to Tia's survey, and A, so the median is 35 for Tia, and we're just taking the difference, and the median of responding to Amir's, what is the value of T minus A? So let's see. How many did Amir do? Amir is 85, right? So that means the middle of that is 42, 43. Okay, so look, 80, 85, 1 through 85, the middle is 43. Okay, because then we'll have 1 through 42 here, 44 through 85 there. Uh, that's going to be my median value. So where does 43 equals? 10, 20, 31. So the 43 value is going to occur in here, which is 30. So 35 minus 30 is 5. Okay. It's 10 hour to 11. 1, 2, 3, 11. I really hope you guys appreciate this time because I am beyond exhausted, <laughs> if you can't tell. Okay, now another, oh my God, more box and whisker plots. Which of the following box plots could represent Amir's survey data? The main thing is we need a median. We need that bar at 30. So all of them have it at 30. Oh, well, okay. And then the range, let's see, my range. Let's go back to the data. It's as low as 15, as high as 45. As low as 15, that's out. Because see, it goes to 5 and beyond 45. 45 and 5, nope. Because that goes only to 15. Did I say 15 or 4? No, 15 is right. Sorry, not 5. That one's actually probably right, but hold on. 15 and 45, that's cool. Oh, these are, no. All right, now, oh, come on. We have to calculate the inner quartile range. That's cray cray. Okay. Uh, yeah. This is insane because I've, I've never seen them make you do this before. So that means they want us to calculate the inner quartile range. So. Okay, I can do this. So we have 15, 20, okay. 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45. 35, 40. 45. Okay, here's how you do the interquartile range. We see that the median is one of these many 35 values, okay? So it's a 30, I mean, sorry, one of these many 30 values. And then we have to look, and then now we have to find the median of the bottom half and the medium, median of the top half. It's like, it's almost like if we were to take this group of data as a separate set of data. So where would the mean, and, and if we think about one through, it would be one through 42 here and 44 through 85. So where's the middle of one through one through 42? It's an even number, so it's 20, in between 21 and 22. Where would this occur? 20. Hold on, 20. 21 is between 65 and 66. So 21 and 22, would be here, so 25 is that lower quartile, and 65 and 66 is 31, 51, 58. In here, 35. So the inner quartile range should be from 25 to 35. 25 to 40, no, 20 to 40, it's this one. 25 to 35, yikes, that is 
I, I've never seen anything like that before on an SAT, and I, I just would doubt they're going to test a – but but box and whisker plots, it's not even on the SAT review material, but that's how you do it. In the xy plane above, lines K and L are perpendicular. What is the x-coordinate point P? Okay. Well, my slope of this one is, you can see here, it's from the origin, so it goes up 3 over 4. So L has a slope of, I'm just going to say L, but it's, I'm talking about the slope of L. It has a slope of 3 fourths. So the slope of K must be negative 4 thirds, clearly, right? This is the opposite reciprocal if it's perpendicular. So then we know that y equals negative 4 thirds x plus b, which is whatever is the y-intercept, which we don't know. But we know that 4, 3 is a point. So then I'm going to plug that in. 3 equals negative 4 thirds times 4 plus b. That's negative 16 over 3. I don't know if I'm doing this the easiest way. There might be an easier way, but is there an easier way? Yeah, there is, actually. It's a negative four-thirds. No. Yeah, there probably is, but I'm, I'm not seeing it. Okay. So I'm going to add 16 thirds to both sides. So it's 9 thirds plus 16 thirds. I turn 3 into 9 thirds because I'm adding this to both sides. It's 25 thirds. So B equals 25 thirds. Let's get rid of all of this. So that means my y-intercept is up here at, this is about uh, um, eight, something like that. Anyways, the point is, is now we need to figure out what P is. P occurs where Y equals zero. Uh, that's my X intercept. So then we solve for X, four thirds X. Subtract 25 thirds, we get negative 25 thirds equals thirds X, and then multiply by the reciprocal, negative three fourths. Uh, these cancel out and the negatives cancel out. So it's 25 over 4, which is 6.25. Okay. Oh, made it to 31, which is good. I think it's at this page. Come on. Here we go. Let's see how much time we have left. 10 minutes. Actually, that's not great. A museum built a scale model of an apatosaurus where one centimeter is equal to 16 centimeters. If the length of the if the length of the femur bone of the actual skeleton is 184, what is the length of the model? <clears throat> That's it. 1 to 16 equals x to 184 cross multiply. Oh, wait, hold on. I can probably do this in my head here. 184 divided by 16. I can't do it in my head. 11.5 to the nearest tenth of a centimeter, so it's 11.5. I'm not going to even think about it. I, I think that's right, but I just got to finish this at this point. How many? 176. Was it? Yeah, I think that's right. How many cups with the capacity of eight fluid ounces can be filled with water from a cooler that contains 10 gallons? That's 1,280 fluid ounces divided by eight is one. 48, 6, and then 0, 160. And triangle ABC, remember it's a triangle, so let's draw it out. Uh, 
All right, so A, B, and C. A is 48, B is 88, and C is 44. Okay, it's similar to LMN. L, M, N. Okay, the ratio of this over this is three, basically. Okay, so we could say this is three X and this is X, essentially. It's a measure in degrees of angle. Oh, but it doesn't matter, it's 48. Because if they're similar, the angles all match up. Okay, and the xy plane cor lines that correspond to the system of equations above intersect the point A, B. All right. Cool. God, these fractions. Okay, I'm going to multiply the top one by the common multiple of 2, 12, and 3, which is 12. So multiply everything by 12. That's 12 times 1 half is 6y equals 19, right, times that 12. The denominator goes away. One third of 12 is 4x, and then we got 5y equals 3x. Mm. Let's do, I'm trying to think substitution or eliminate. Let's do elimination. So I'm going to multiply the top by 3 and the bottom by 4. And this becomes 18y equals 57 minus 12x. This becomes 20y equals 12x. I'm just going to move that over so it's lined up. Add everything. Those go away. 57 equals 38y. Did I do that right? 20. Hold on. 6. Six times three is eighteen. I'm just saying. I'm just questioning because I'm gonna get not so good numbers. Mm, I don't like that. So y equals fifty-seven over thirty-eight. Usually on a question like this, I wouldn't be that bad. But anyways, now let's plug it in and solve for x. I'll use that second equation: five times thirty-seven, or sorry, fifty-seven. equals 3x, uh, 250 plus 35 is 285 over 38. And then divide both sides by 3, which is the same as multiplying by 1 third. So it's 285 over 90 is 114, equals the x. And so it's this value, which is my x over b. divided by 57. God, this is not good. Oh, it actually works out. Look, it's keep change flip. So I'll mul turn this into multiply. And I'll flip this into 38 over 57. Oh, wait, no. Yeah, right? And then this cross simplifies. 57 goes into 285 uh, five times. 38 goes into 114 three times. Yes. So it's five thirds. Okay, I feel better about that now. Oh my God, I only have four minutes left. Okay, five thirds. Let's try to make some room here. Oh, shoot. Here, let's just move this. Okay, we really got to hustle now. I usually have way more time on the, on the calculator section, but don't want to make excuses here, but I'm so tired right now and I think I've just been going a little slowly. So let's see, we, we got four minutes and I think I can do it. Unless these are brutal. But okay. 
what values of z represents this? Okay, so I'm going to subtract 5 over 2, so it's negative 5 over 2 z plus z equals negative 21 over 8. So that's 2 over 2, so it's negative 3 over 2 z over 8. And then multiply both sides by negative 2 thirds, which is the reciprocal that goes away. So it's the negatives cancel out, so it's 42 over 24, which is divided by 2 is 21 over 12, which is 7 over 4. So I'll say 7 over 4. Leave it at that. Normally I would be a little more thorough, but that's okay. As a diameter of this, and points there and there. Okay, if the point 0B lies on the circle, what is the value of B? Uh, Hold on. Um, let's see here, zero B. I think we need to calculate the, okay, darn it. So let's calculate the radius, which is half of this distance. So this is a distance of, distance formula is it's eight squared plus six squared, which is 64 plus 36, which is 100. Square root of that is 10. So the diameter is 10, the radius is five. So the distance between, and the center of the circle is six is three, zero. Okay, it's the average, it's the middle of this. I just did it in my head. So three, zero in the distance formula has to be distance of five. So three minus zero squared is nine plus B squared. This has to equal five. So 9 plus b squared equals 25, 16, so it's 4, b equals 4. Okay, two minutes left. Next we have, I'll finish this regardless, even if I run out of time. A rowing team has entered 2,000 meter race. The teams each analyzing race based on the team splits from above. Split time is the time it takes to complete 500 meters. Fourth split of the race, the team rowed at a rate of 28 strokes per minute. Okay. To the nearest whole number, how many strokes did it take the team to complete 500 meters? 28 strokes per one minute. And it took 440 seconds, which is 440 divided by 60. Seven and a third. Wait, 220. So then we multiply it by seven and a third, which is. So I'm multiplying these. I'm doing this like so sloppy right now. I'm not sure if this is right. 22 times 28. I'm just trying to finish this. Divided by three equals, I'll say 205. Um, 205 strokes, right? That's my guess. Uh, okay, the, by the end of the season, the coach wants the team to reduce its mean split by time by 10%. At the end of the season, what should the team split time be in seconds? So they want to reduce it. So the mean split time is 120, 240 divided by... Four, no, 220, sorry, 440 uh, divided by 4 is 110. And we want to reduce it by 10%, so 0 0.9. It was 99, right? I want to reduce it to 99. 99 seconds. All right, 30 seconds over. Stop the timer. And let's check the answers. Oops. Uh-oh, I got 37 wrong. I can already see. Hold on, what did I, let me actually, let me think about 37 again really quickly because I really rushed it. 
during the fourth, I don't think I understood the question. During the fourth split of the race, which is here. Oh, that's why. They were just talking about the fourth split of the race. I didn't even read that. The fourth split of the race was just 108 seconds, uh, which would have been so much easier. So, which is 108 seconds, oops, 108, and then I should have multiplied that by 28, over 60 and then yeah it's 28 times 108 and then that divided by 60 is 50 yeah it's 50 but I, I gotta mark that wrong because uh, yeah I just I totally rushed it so what I calculated if you saw originally was I calculated the total um, split time so just a silly mistake uh, okay, I think I got the picture. Let's check our work here. Oops. Oh, wait, I didn't. Hold on. Okay, number one, so C A C B C A C B. Then four, five, A B A A A B A A. Nine is B C D C B C. D C thirteen is B C A C B C A C and then seventeen D C D D C D uh and then we got 20. A, C, B. Wait, what? 20 is A? Oh, shoot. How did I get this wrong? Dang it. Uh, 20 is. All right, so this one's incorrect. Let's see what I do. So based on the Joule uh, Energy Pyramid, primary producer for 5,000. Oh, shoot. God, I'm so bad. I didn't read the this graph carefully. You know, these are the mistakes from from exhaustion. This is why it's it is important to get a a good night's rest the the night before because it's just silly stuff like that. You can know the math, but look. So they asked to secondary consumers, not primary consumers. I I just assumed secondary was up there. So we have to keep going, okay? And this becomes fifty, right? Ten percent, ten percent. So then we, it should have been the same equation, x over 50. So it's literally you move the decimal over one spot, and it's 11.96, which is A. So all right, there that is. Then 21 is C, 22 is B. OK. 23 is B. B, 24 is B, 25 is D, 26 is A, okay. uh, 28 is C, B, and D, 30. Okay, now let's look at the free response. Wait, what? Oh. All right, 31 is 11.5, good. 32 is 160. 
48. Please be five thirds. Yeah. That was the one with the really crazy numbers. <clears throat> Seven fourths. Sweet. Four. That one remembers 50. I already calculated it. And then that's 99. Oh my God. Ugh. Oh my God. I'm so dead. Let's see what questions there are. I don't know how long I can answer questions, but um, <laughs> yeah, uh, look, that those small mistakes that happen right now, I can tell you for sure, are due to me being tired. So when we're talking about being tired, that's just it's it's gonna that's that's it. So tonight, guys, get a really good night's rest. Other than that, it's reading carefully, double checking your work. I mean, it's all the, these other things that you want to be really precise with your numbers and really precise with reading the diagram. But if you're careful and you care, it's good. I see somebody asked for number 36 and 37. 36 I'll definitely explain because I really I did it so fast. So like, look, here's the deal. They give you these points on a circle and they're saying they're the end points. Okay, whatever it is, negative one, negative three, and seven, three. Okay. And we need to find, and they're saying some point here is zero B. We need to figure out what this point is if it's on the circle. So the first thing we usually have to do with the circles, we have to find the center. So my center, I know since these are endpoints of a diameter, it says. I know that I can find the center by finding the midpoint of these guys. So I found the midpoint to be three, zero. It's right in the middle. You add these, divide by two, add these, divide by two, you get three, zero. And then I wanna figure out what this point is. Well, I know that since this lies on the circle, it's gotta have a distance of whatever the, the radius is. And I can figure out the radius by just figuring out what's the distance from here to here. And that's what I did with the distance formula. I did seven minus three, which is four squared, three minus zero, which is three squared. So four squared plus three squared equals 25. Square root of that is five. And that's what the distance formula is, and we know that it's a distance of five. So this radius is also a distance of five. So if I know that, I can use the distance formula in reverse and say five equals the square root of the difference of the x's, three minus zero squared, um, plus the difference of the y's, which is b minus zero, b squared. And then I solve this equation for b, and I get my answer. And yeah, Piyush, I did it because so many of you guys were asking to, to uh, what's it called? Uh, <laughs> to, for me to do this earlier so you guys could be on. So I did it for you, man, and I hope you appreciate it because I am super tired. Let's look at... Let's look at 37 again. Look, all 37, all that was happening is they're saying they finished the, the fourth split at 28 strokes per minute. Okay, 28 strokes per 60 seconds. So then the nearest number, how many strokes did it take them to complete that final 500? Well, if they don't go at a rate of 28 per 60 seconds and that final lap or final split is 108 we just multiply 108 seconds, we multiply it by 28 over 60 times 108 over one. And we get, we get I think 50.4, which I rounded to 50. And um, all right, Doram, I see, shoot, you have like a bunch of questions. I don't know if I can get all of these. I'm, I'm just being honest with you. I, I'm, uh, I'm struggling right now and I, and I need to start getting ready for my day because I, I got to go to school where I teach. <laughs> Um, let's see, let me l explain 31. Let me do 31 um, first here. Hold on, let me just look at anything else. Uh, hopefully you know how to find the median now because I did it on one of the questions. No, do not grid in all the answers, D-ball, at the end. That is a dangerous strategy. I would grid them in as you're going along. Uh, yeah, for sure. These, these videos exist, actually, on the data analysis and passport to advanced math. 
Okay. Is the SAT in October usually hard? I mean, varies, you know? It's, it, they're supposed to be all relatively consistent. I think this last October, though, the math was on the easy side. Okay. All right. Oh, I got 20 wrong. I think I figured that out, yeah. Eventually, right when I checked it. I can't remember which one I got wrong. Uh, Blaze, you're very welcome. Uh, 15 and 36. I think I just did 36 again. And then 15. Okay, I'm going to start with 31 because I know that's a harder level question for Tatiana. So, Tatiana, let me go to 31. Oh, actually, that's this one. Okay. So look, they're telling you that the scale for the scale model is one centimeter to 16 centimeters. That's how I, oh, I'm going to start up a set up a scale problem like this equals. Okay, so one, so it's scale to actual. And now they're saying the length of the femur bone is actually so actual goes on the bottom 184. What is the scale uh, value and it's just like that and then you cross multiply. So that's how you're solving 31. Uh, I see, Dorama. I'll, I'll do this. I'll do 34 because that's um, a later problem. Uh, I Oh, that's a really long one. Look, 34, Dorama, is just a system of equations. And you solve any system of equations the same. Now, I chose to solve it via elimination. And that's really how you have to approach this. You, you need to... And, they made it hard with all these fractions. Now you didn't. I didn't have to do what I did in terms of multiplying everything by twelve, but I did that to get rid of the fractions and make it easier. So once I multiplied everything by twelve, I got five y equals three x for the top, and then the other one became this. And then I chose to. Oh, I think I deleted it. Whatever I had, it was like two y, two y equals nineteen minus four x, something like that. And then. No, 6y. And then after that, I used I used elimination to solve. But, but after that point, it's the same as any system of equations. It's just the fraction at the beginning is something to deal with. Now, if I, if I hadn't done that, I could have still done elimination. It just would have been, it would have been a lot more tricky. Like I could have, I could have multiplied the top one by 9. 9 times negative 1 third, it would be 3. And then the x's would have matched up, eliminated. I just would have had to deal with a bunch of fractions, which I don't like doing. Okay. Okay, guys, I am um, I think I'm going to have to call it there. Combination of exhaustion and the fact that I, I really do have to get going. Uh, I, have to, I have to be at my school by 7.15, and it's 6.25 here, so i got to get ready. But here's the thing. Uh, hopefully you've been watching these problems and watching me do these demos for the last week and getting some confidence and, and learning, really learning the math because that's what's the most important thing here is learning the math. And you've been doing the work, you put in the time, now you just got to chill. This is the point where I told you don't do anything else. Don't don't go and practice a bunch of stuff. I, I saw, I think, Priyush, you said you're going to go watch uh, other videos. I feel like you've been watching for so long and you've been working so hard already, this is the night before your test. You don't wanna keep stressing yourself out and going over more material. I just don't, I think it's now diminishing returns. I'd say now you just chill. So take the rest of the night off, eat something good that you like. Uh, maybe watch a movie that you've seen before, read a relaxing book, get in bed early, and that's it. In the morning, wake up nice and early, not where you're rushing or scrambling. You don't want to be rushing the morning of to the test center because that'll get, create an adrenaline spike and then a drop, and then you're going to be you're going to be tired and groggy. So you want to give yourself plenty of time, get there nice and early, and 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 just knock it out. Eat a healthy breakfast, no sugar, good protein. Eggs would be great. A little bit of meat, maybe if it's healthy meat like turkey or, or chicken. 
vegetables would be good, believe it or not, you know, and your maybe eggs with some good veggies, broccoli, spinach, stuff like that. Lots and lots of water. Caffeine only if you're used to drinking caffeine. If you regularly drink caffeine to study, coffee, tea, whatever, and that's part of your routine, stick with it. If you don't, don't introduce it tomorrow. It's a bad idea. You don't want to throw any curveballs in there. And that's it. I have a video called What to Do the Morning of the SAT. So watch that. You can watch that now It's because it's really short. I think it's just a few minutes. But it'll just give you a rundown of everything you need to remember, to remember to bring tomorrow morning and make sure that you've got all your ducks in a row. You can do some breathing exercises to calm yourself down and make sure your mind is in the, in the right place emotionally. Uh, and, and there you go, guys. So I wish you all the best. And I hope you and like I said, if you if you found this stuff helpful and useful, if you could click the like button, I'd really appreciate it. The likes help my channel a lot uh, f for my engagement. Hopefully it helps in the algorithm to help spread the word and get more people to watch and check out my videos and tutorials and get them more prepared for the SAT. So that, that would be a huge help to me if you could click the like button. And if you want to see more, you can always subscribe, of course, uh, to the channel. And we got stuff more than just ma uh, SAT prep. Or now we're going to be expanding the schedule actually next week. Uh, doing more test prep, but also we got the math music videos. We're going to have general study tips, which is going to be really cool. So that's it. Guys, thank you so much. I wish you all the best of luck. I hope you crush it. Please get back in touch with me once you've taken the test and you get your results. And give me your, your, your glory stories of how you've improved. And if there's things that maybe you're like, hey, I wish I would have done more of this or seen more of that and my score didn't turn out, whatever, uh, hit me up about that as well. And if you need, have any specific questions you want me to answer on my streams, email them to me. I know a couple of you guys have already reached out to me via email and that's awesome. So definitely take advantage of that. And that's it. Best of luck. And I'll see you guys next time. Take it easy.